Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the Fortress. My name is Jinx and today we're looking at episode number three of the campaign award medal system for Global War 1936 version three for the tournament of the Spring Offensive 2021. So this is a collaborative work between myself and Panzer King. I've done much of the software aspect of things, designing the ins and outs of how things work under the hood, and Panzer King has been taking care of acquiring the ribbons, putting them together, and that type of thing. So altogether, it's been a very pleasant working relationship, and I'm really having a lot of fun. So the whole idea of these campaign ribbon system is a way that people can attend these tournaments, and for future times showing up, they can see what nation was played, how well they did, if their side won or lost, and which tournaments they attended as well. Kind of keeps a track of a person's campaign, as it were. So without further ado, let's drop in and take a look at the Soviet Union. So the campaign ribbon is structured with three different ribbons put together. You'll have your campaign ribbon, the prestige ribbon, and your national ribbon. So the campaign ribbon will be unique ribbon for each tournament. It'll have a number attachment that will count the annual tournaments. The number attachments begin at 1 in 2021 and will count up from there. The prestige ribbon shows how many prestigious accomplishments the player achieved within the game by attaching prestige stars. One star is a fairly basic achievement, two stars is going above duty, three stars is exceptional work, and four stars is a rare and astounding achievement. The national ribbon shows which nation was played by the recipient. It may have a gold or silver star attachment depending if the nation won first, second, and third place, third place being a blank ribbon. It may further have an oak leaf sim attachment to symbolize how many major powers are played by the recipient. So it's, it's blank if you only played one major power. If you're playing two, you get a bronze oak leaf, a silver is three, and four is a gold oak leaf. So the Soviets will only have, they'll have a blank one without an oak leaf, unless they evolve the CCCP or the Chinese uh, Communist Party into a major power, and then they'll have a bronze oak leaf. So that's what's represented here. So the Soviet awards, the Soviet um, prestige awards, that's what the rest of this article is about. Everything else is set in stone, the campaign ribbon, the national ribbon, but the prestige ribbon and how those stars function is kind of what's up for grabs. And my idea here is to try to make it as balanced as possible. So um, as balanced as possible, because people come to this game with many different experiences, uh, you know, with different range of experiences, how many games they have under the belt, who they play more common. And sometimes you have little ecosystems where certain people's standard way of doing things in one city might be different than another city. So it's to kind of correlate everybody to kind of get on the same page. So my, my goal here is to get endorsement from the community, get feedback and good ideas from the community, and uh, improve this as much as possible. So you may see some changes. So a quick note on these prestige stars is you could get up to four stars. Now that it's structured in such a way that in the first tier, there's like three options to get one star, second tier as well, three options. And so there's ways of getting these stars. If you happen to get no stars in the second tier, like you play a game where, where it just doesn't seem to work out for you, it doesn't mean that if you get your third star, they'll automatically get um, the, you know, the second tier category as well. It won't have three stars on your ribbon. You'll simply have two stars, one for the first tier and one for the three third tier. That's the idea there. Okay, let's dive into what it means specifically. So in tier one, you can score one from this category. First one up is we have Army Reform. Gain a prestige star if, at any point during the game, the USSR has won a war against any neutral nation, barring Mongolia, which control more than one territory at the start of the game. The war is defined as one when the USSR is no longer legally allowed by the rules to capture more territory from the, that nation at that specific time. So this is similar to what I had previously. Before I had something like you would get a handicap and you still have to go against a neutral nation. Um, and you'd, you'd roll a dice and that many dice, combat dice, you'd have to remove from the combat before the round started. Now this is a little bit different because the community did not like that one too much and so I changed up a little bit and about this whole the war is defined as one. So the reason I put that in there is because in the case of Finland and signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the war is technically won once the Russians capture Karelia. And at that point the war is not won necessarily but concluded but in regards to these rules I'm going to consider it won. Next one up is we have the Iron Wave. Now the Iron Wave is gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, the USSR control more armor type units than any other major power. Now in World War I, um, at the start of the war and at the end of the war, Russia had more armor than any other nation. I think any other nation combined. It had a lot of armor, and so this is to represent that. So you see one is for the end of the game and one is at any point during the game, but this one here, the Army Reform, is going to be earlier rather than later, because once the USSR is at war with any other major power, there's no longer any neutral nations. Once the USSR is at war with a major power and declares war on Finland, then Finland automatically becomes German, and so you can't win it. So one is at two extremes. 
So if you want to get armor reform, you have to do it before you're at war with Germany, which is incentivizes you to sign that Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact so you're done with that war quickly. Next one up, we have War of Liberation. Gain a prestige star if, at any point during the game, the CCP Chinese income before bonuses is greater than the KMT. This one's not too difficult to achieve. It, do, it takes a little bit of maneuvering to do it and to try to pick up some territory that the Japanese aren't grabbing, but it is completely doable. So that's the well, that's the first tier stuff and how to get a star here. Now in the second tier, in the second tier here, we have Operation Uranus. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of a USSR turn, the USSR have encircled an enemy force of, of a major power of at least three units, and the enemy force cannot, at that time, trace a supply path to a factory in its control. This one could be really easy or really difficult. You know, if the German player plays its card, cards right, it could prevent it from happening. And then the, and then the Russian player has to plan it out sufficiently as well. You know, they have to encircle something, but they can't actually capture that area as well. And so the three units could be shifted up and down as needed. But I thought three, three is strong enough that it's not going to be, three is strong enough that it's not going to be just a skirmishing force, but it's not going to be large enough that you're going to be backing it up and out of the fight or at risk of being cut off yourself. Operation Uranus, of course, is representative of Stalingrad. That's the operation that encircled the force at Stalingrad. Next up, we have the Manchurian Operation. Gain a prestige star if, at any point during the game, the USSR or a member of its alliance control all or most of the territory with a Japanese printed roundel on the Asian continent mainland, which is non-island territory. One of the territories included below can be omitted from this objective. Northern, Eastern and Western Manchuria, Rihi and Korea. So that is going to be these ones here. Northern, Western, Eastern Manchuria, Rihi and Korea. Now with one of them being excluded, you could of course leave out Korea if you need to. And that way, um, and this is also if Soviets or a member of its alliance captured. So even if the CCP come in here, it does help out as well. Yeah, the USSR are a member of its alliance. So lastly, in the tier two, we have the Workers' Triumph. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, the USSR control more factories on the entire map than the number of non-USSR factories in the European continent. So that basically means if the Russians, they count up the amount of fa major factories they have, and they count it against all the major factories in Europe, which includes Britain, Italy, France, Berlin, you know, all those other major factories, and they have to have more at the end of the game. So that one's completely doable, in my opinion. It doesn't take too much, especially if Germany is out of the picture. Okay, now we're on to Tier 3. Tier 3, you can score one from this tier. First one is Nushago Nazat. No step back. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of each USSR turn, the USSR controls at least four city territories across the entire map. Now, this one is quite hard to do. Now, normally, you have city territories here, so you have one, two, three, four, five city territories, plus Novosibirsk here. And then, of course, if you pick up, you know, Madrid over here and Istanbul, then it increases what you have as well. And there's nothing in Sweden anymore, so you really are limited to what you can do. So when the Germans start pushing in here, you're going to have to really hold on to your territories. Now, in a historical game, like if, if you put this into history, Russia did manage to hold out Leningrad, Moscow, Stalingrad, and of course Novosibirsk over here. They all held out till the end of the war, and uh, they didn't have any other city territories aside from that. So with a historical outcome, they should be able to do it, and I would consider that a well-fought game. That's exceptionally well done, especially in the face of, of German aggression. Now, it's unlikely that they're going to hold on to Smolensk and Kiev, and most games I've seen in Global War 36, Leningrad actually falls to the Germans as well. I'd say a good 80 to 90% of the time I've seen Leningrad fall when Germany goes after Russia. So it might be actually quite a bit difficult depending on what the Germans do. Now keep in mind too that the Germans have this incentive to go after, um, to go after Russian cities. They have an objective for Leningrad and they have an objective for Stalingrad. So we'll see this vicious fight occurring where both sides want to hold on to those cities. So it might be in Russia's best interest to pick up some other territories, perhaps in Istanbul, perhaps in Madrid, so that it can hold on to some territories a little bit long, to hold on to some city territories until the end of the game or for e at the end of each round. Next up we have something called Japanese Strategic Offensive. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, the USSR or a member of its alliance control one territory of the Japanese homeland. Now, as you know, Japanese homeland is basically just the island here 
island here, but not including Okinawa, so all these ones. So that's going to be difficult to do. The CCP or the Russians have to build some transports and get the troops across, or they could even airdrop some troops across into Hokkaido, perhaps. But that's going to be pretty difficult, and so that's why I'd categorize it up at Tier 3. It's also an alt history option as well, which, as you know, I, I feel like these things need to have an alt history as option, so it's not all out against the Allies. So I also want to point out in these previous ones, that not all of these are against the Allies or the Russians. You know, Army, uh, Iron Wave, you don't need to be at war with anybody for that. War of Liberation, well, that's a continuation of a certain war as well. And this Army Reform as well, you don't need to be at war with either the Axis or the Allies. And the next tier, well, these ones are a little bit harder to do because you need to be at war with a major power, but it doesn't specify which major power. The Manchurian Operation is, of course, against the Axis, and the Workers' Triumph is, of course, against the... is against... Well, that one's not against anybody. That's more of a peaceful option. In the tier three, well, this one is easy to do and you don't have to be at war with anybody for that. The Japanese strategic offensive is in the face of everybody and it's the alt history. And so now we move on to the next one, which is founding the People's Republic of China. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, the CCP or a member of its alliance control all or most of the CCP home country. Four of the territories included below can be omitted from this objective. Oh, four of the territories included can be omitted from this objective. It doesn't say included below, so that would still work. Anyways, moving on to the tier four stuff. This is the, the very rare and difficult to achieve victories. Like this is a top tier. Like if you're going into a game and somebody comes out with uh, four tiers of uh, four stars, you know they did really, really well. So the first one is socialist domination. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, the USSR or a member of its alliance control the majority of continental non-island territories in the continent of Europe. For the purposes of scoring, territories with a Russian or a Turkish printer roundel are not considered to be part of the continent of Europe. Sweden, Norway, and Finland are considered part of Europe. There are 52 continental territories on the European continent. The USSR or a member of its alliance needs to control 27 of these. So I should probably state that Britain is also not part of, you know, it's not, Britain is an island, so I should think it's obvious, but I should probably put it in there just to double check with everybody as well. So I need to control 27 non-island territories. So let's mark off what those 27 would be. So you have three here. You could have another one, two, three here. So that's six. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. You could grab all of this. And if you grab East Prussia, that makes 12. So I'm gonna put in here, that's 12. Now, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Let's say 19 will bring us up to here. Is that right? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Oh, well, let's try that again. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So that's 17. Let's go 18, 19, 20. That's a total of 20 at this point. And now you're looking at pretty historical path, right? This 20, uh, we're at 20, but we need 27. And this is roughly the historical extent of the Soviets at the end of World War II. Now, of course, they did do something with Austria. I think Austria is kind of a middle ground, so that would bring us to 21, but let's leave it out for a second. So we need to grab a few more territories beyond that in continental Europe. So we need another seven. So can we go up here? One, two, three, four, five. That gets five, so we still need to grab two more. Well, perhaps Austria, perhaps Albania, and that gets us up to 27, but that's purely at the discretion of the players, whatever they want to do in this case. If they want to go for more northerly or more southerly, either way works pretty good. And I think that would give them this nice domination. So let's mark it out as if they captured something here. Well, let's say they grabbed Austria, so 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. And now we hold all of that. And that's pretty intimidating at this point, right? Like this is really intimidating how much they've grabbed. And if they grab Bavaria or Western Germany, that pushes things a little bit more. So let's say we simply grab Albania, boom. Now at that point, there's very little free territory left in Europe. Of course, yes, we have all of Spain, all of uh, France, and this is perhaps how much we need We need to probably bump this one up to make it a little bit more challenging. Now, my experiences of the game, my experiences of the game is the game usually ends before this point, before the Russians push on to Germany. But it's tough to say, I really don't know. So you guys will have to check with me as well, but usually I see the Americans or the allies come dropping troops off and they grab some of these territories beforehand. And of course, the Americans and the Allies don't like it when this happens up in Scandinavia as well. So let me know your feedback on this one. It's the bigger tier stuff that is a little bit more hard to manage and plan out. So that is socialist domination. 
Next up we have The Great Game. This is named after in, well, before World War One in the Age of Imperialism, it was called The Great Game by the British, so I used the same thing. Boshaya Igra. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, the USSR or a member of its alliance controls all or most of the following territories. Five of them can be omitted. All territory with the USSR printed roundel, all territory with the Turkish printed roundel, all territory with the Iranian printed roundel, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and three territories with the British Commonwealth printed roundel. So that definitely, definitely goes after them a little bit. So let's see where that would be. So it's all Turkish, Iranian, it's all down here. So that's we have an exception of five, so that's one, two, three, four, five. We're really pushing it down there. Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Do I have Iran on here? Yes, Iran. So this is holding on to a lot of territory, and then three from over here, three from the Com uh, British Commonwealth. But let's say that we didn't do that. Let's say we didn't do that at all. Let's say that these guys, you know, those are part of our exception. So three of these and plus two more. Well, we could also not take some of these off, or we could even say something here in the Far East. If the Allies come in here and land some troops off, then they still can grab two territories and we'll be fairly safe. But it also means that you have to protect North Sakhalin as well, because that is included as part of it as well. So that's going to be one. And let's say if they grab one more territory here, well, you're fairly set. You know, but at that point, you're really risking it and really might want to actually grab some of those British Commonwealth territories so you don't have as much of an exception. So this one's hard to balance, of course, but it is late game. So I think, I have in mind after talking about it with you guys here, that I should extend this a little bit further. Um, the trick is I didn't want to go against the Allies, and I'm also running out of space for neutrals, right? So I could say Syria, Transjordan, but that gets into difficult territory as well. Um, but let me know your thoughts on this one about what it should look like. So that takes care of the great game. So in my opinion, after talking about it with you guys, the great game isn't too hard to get, you know, especially if the, the Germans aren't on your back. But the Germans are also going to be playing with this as well. So more times than not, I expect they're going to go after the they're going to go after the Russians in this game. But I could be wrong. So perhaps there's two adjustments I can make here. Instead of 52 continental territories, I just extend it to all territories in Europe. You know, like every single territory, island and not. So what would that change? Well, I think it would be, now you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight extra territories, plus nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then there's a debate about here, 15, 16, 17, 17. So 17 extra territories, which let's say if we round that roughly to half, that's an extra nine territories that they would need to grab. Well, with nine extra territories, that would be, get really difficult. You can go one, two, three over here. Three, four, five, six. You see my point? Seven, eight, nine. That's a lot of territory they need to grab. Like they're definitely dominating by quite a bit. And that's not touching any of the islands yet, right? That's just purely going off of this. So that's the debate there of how to make it a little bit harder. And at that point, yeah, the allies are definitely the small character here with just Britain and France over here. You'd really see some massive maneuvers happening as the Soviets. And likewise, this one probably needs to be bumped up a little bit as well, just to make it a little harder. And so perhaps in that case, it should be Syria and Transjordan should be added onto there, perhaps. And maybe we should throw in Yemen and Oman over here, make it a little bit more difficult for them to grab, because it's between, you know, you have to travel across Commonwealth territory and that type of thing. So let me know your feedback on this one about what we should do in regards to the Soviet USSR objectives. Now, this one, uh, I'm very open to your thoughts and comments. I'm rattling these off fairly quickly without as much thought as I'd like. So let me know your feedback and what I can improve on the matter. Thank you all for watching. Cheers.